We get people come up here to Chabot all the time wanting to see the Milky Way. Unfortunately, we can't show it to them because of the light pollution. So it's, more and more, it's getting to the point where the only way you can experience what the night sky really looks like is either A, go find yourself a really dark location high up in the mountains, far away from city lights, or come here to our planetarium. When you're inside the planetarium, you see the sky pretty much the way you would if you were up on that high mountain away from city lights. You know, people are amazed. They get to actually see the Milky Way. They get to see thousands of stars instead of maybe a few dozen stars. And they really experience what the night sky looked like a hundred years ago from here in the Bay Area. We live in a world that is woefully short of humble behavior, and I, I come here to be humbled. Every year, we come out here about this time of year when the when it's just starting to rise, right. and we all have the same uh, response like, oh, there's clouds coming in, <gasps> no, that's the Milky Way. Yeah. For being in the middle of the night, it's kind of it's kind of bright out here, and I started noticing I was casting a shadow as I was walking yeah. along. And, and then we look up and we realize it's because the Milky Way is so bright that yeah. it's casting a shadow. When I look up at a, a sky full of stars, and, and my, my favorite is to be in, in those, those places where literally the instant your eyes lift above the horizon, the stars pop into existence. And so it's a it's a full bowl. Uh, a hemisphere above you of uh, just rich with stars that you feel like you could reach out and touch. You know, we always say that travel increases your worldview and your depth of thinking. And I guess we're kind of doing that in the maximum possible way because we're showing people things that are so mind-bogglingly far away we're not only showing people distance, but we're showing people time. You're looking at the history of the Earth. You're looking at the history of our solar system, our galaxy, the universe as a whole. Every single one yeah. of these stars, all of the light that you're seeing came from some time in the past. So we're looking at basically a giant time machine. And each one of these dots that you're seeing right now, it left that star potentially millions or even billions of years ago. For me, the charge is whether it's just looking back like we are right now or finding it in the telescope, understanding that those photons left so long ago only to strike my eye. That is an amazing feeling. An amazing, you know, especially when I've been looking for something you know, when I look at the chart and it's 70 million light years away, it's like, holy cow, that was, those photons left 70 million years ago, and if we believe the science, that's back when the dinosaurs were around, and here it is finally striking my eye. When I am viewing the skies, and I'm looking at nebula, and I'm looking at stars, and I'm looking at galaxies, and I'm looking at star clusters, I'm actually traveling through space. And so for myself, it's a way to reconcile the fact that I will never physically be in space, but through the end of my telescope, I am in fact traveling through space. I mean, how many times tonight have we all gone like, oh wow, did you see that? Whoa! Actually, how many of us put uh, new moon on our calendars for our family so they know? And oh, how many absolutely. Of us, how many of absolutely. us instruct family members now, don't schedule this during well, the Well, my, my two daughters got married, and both of them asked me which, which, <laughs> mu which weekend in September <laughs> could they not get married. <laughs> <laughs> it is like drug addiction because it's a very pleasurable experience that we organize our life around and that our mood changes with. That's right. So, That's right. so And that we spend all our money on. Then we <laughs> yeah, you're right, it is a good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for me, it's, it's great because I sunburn easily, so I've got to do something that's, that's, that's at night. <laughs> you know, so it works out great for me. So when you, when you do get a chance 
to get out to a dark sky. And you look up and you see that, that, that sky full of stars. We are living in a galaxy of over a hundred billion stars. There's over a hundred billion, perhaps a trillion other galaxies out there. And the number of other stars, the numbers of other places there could be life is staggering. And especially with the recent discoveries from the Kepler mission that potentially as many as half those stars you see in the sky at night, half of them could have planets. And even with pessimistic numbers, you are now starting to talk about perhaps millions, at least tens of thousands of other planets out there where there could be some form of life. And, and that, that for me is what, what blows my mind on a nightly basis. We are made of stardust. We are the descendants of ancient stars in the sense that some of the elements that were fused in the interiors of those stars were incorporated into our own bodies. We are the, the material of the cosmos. It's learned how to understand itself. Every single generation of human beings up until really only 200 years ago saw a star-filled sky every single night of the year. And that is what we have robbed people of today. The viewing in Silicon Valley or anywhere within an hour of it is just, it's terrible. You, you can't see, other than a couple of the really bright objects, you're missing out on, mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> all of this. <laughs> 80% of North American and, and European populations no longer live someplace where they can even faintly see the Milky Way from their homes. It's hard enough under a perfect sky to try to figure out how we fit into it all. But at least we've got a reference, you know. Without the sky, oh, there was, that's a huge loss. With a star-filled sky, our ancestors developed science, the science that we have today. Harriet Tubman took so many slaves to freedom is because she could read the sky. She followed the drinking gourd, followed the North Star. We've made a sky in which nobody bothers to look anymore. So the North Star, that star that, that was a signal for those, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, for a fixed point in the sky by which to navigate. Well, most people today don't even know where the North Star is. I've traveled to, to central Los Angeles where you can look up on a clear summer evening. I can count all 12 stars in the sky. And in fact, one of those is probably on its way to LAX. So 11, 11 stars. When you have only 11 stars in the sky, it very quickly sends the message, there's no point in looking up. What we know about our universe has no direct bearing when all you can see in the sky is a handful of stars. Dark places in the United States are becoming fewer and fewer. We live in the city and we're, we're used to it. I mean, it's a shame yeah, we, we can't, are used to it. It's a shame we can't see stars in the city. Even though, you know, I look up every night from my front porch, I look up like this, and I would see four. I would look around and see four stars, or maybe five. This is depressing in the city. It's so depressing. What if there was nothing but fog every day? You could drive down the street. You could only see 50 feet in front of you. You could never see a vista. You'd, you'd cross the Rocky Mountains in a fog all the time. What would you lose? It's like it would be similar. We lose the connection, we lose the ability to understand that there are other worlds out there. We are not by ourselves. We are not the only star. We are not the only planet. And I believe we are not the only life in the cosmos. Imagine you're out camping in the back country of your park and you're, you're sleeping under the stars. And now imagine I took that sky away and I replaced it with the sky that I see back in Los Angeles, an orange glow with just a few scattered pinpricks. Wouldn't you say you've lost something? Wouldn't you say that some aspect of your enjoyment, your presence in the natural world had disappeared? Our lights that shine upwards, that create light pollution, they're robbing us of the, the stars overhead. And so they're robbing us of this natural view of our universe at night. So imagine, imagine a child 
that never got to see a tree. Well, we're doing the same thing here by raising entire generation, and in fact, creating future generations that may never see a star. And if you don't see a star, if you don't wonder about this universe overhead, and so create a, a world in which what you can see ends at our own atmosphere, then where is that next generation of science, science and scientists going to come from? You grow up in a city and you've never experienced the night sky, and then you're told that you're living in light pollution. It's kind of like, say what? You know, what, it's, what is light pollution? What are you even talking about? The light pollution here in the Bay Area, especially for us here at Chabot, has gotten worse over the last several years. Here at Chabot Space and Science Center, we have a 36-inch reflecting telescope, Nelly. It's part of a global network of observatories that search for and track near-Earth asteroids. Asteroids and comets are still out there. We have the ability to detect them, but only if we can see them. In order for us to see these asteroids in our images, we have to have really dark skies. A small asteroid may be somewhere around magnitude 20, which means it's a million times fainter than the faintest star you can see with your naked eye in a really dark location. And as more and more light pollution develops, uh, it becomes harder and harder to see those really faint asteroids. And that means we can't see the small ones even when they're close, and we can't see the big ones when they're farther away. And that, that's a problem, you know, if you're trying to find a, a large asteroid, not hours before it hits us, but years before it hits us, you want to be able to see it even when it's pretty far away. And as light pollution increases, it becomes harder and harder to do that. And this is getting worse, and it's been getting worse ever since they started installing these uh, new LED streetlights. Awareness of light pollution and the, and the problems that it's producing is, is the number one issue for helping solve it. The amount of energy that's wasted through senseless lighting is a contributor to our energy consumption and our carbon footprint. Uh, it's estimated here in the United States up to 40% of the lighting that we use is wasted. It's just money down the drain. Here in the United States, we use an awful lot of uh, light at, at night. Unfortunately, we've sort of grown up in a culture of very inexpensive uh, electricity. If you want to attract attention, you use light because it's natural at nighttime. If you see a light that's bright, you're going to look towards it. And so many retail outlets will take advantage of this. And you, you notice, of course, with gas stations that there's a progressive increase with the amount of light to attract interest. The lighting under a gas station canopy is advertisement. It's see me. And if a guy puts a gas station in the opposite corner, see me more. Some of these gas stations have higher light levels than the kinds of light you experience during the day. And how is that possible? I have measured <laughs> lighting in, in some service stations that came out to 112 foot candles. When the ISNA recommended a luminance level at the pump is five foot candles. So over 20 times the recommended a luminance level. Think about what happens when you're in that situation. What your eye does, well, what it's supposed to do, it torques down the iris. Think about it, it's night, and it's so bright, your, eye, your pupils have to constrict. That's, that's nuts. There's a difference, I think, between something that screams at you and says, we're, we're bright, as opposed to something that says, look, we're a safe environment and it's comfortable. If you would go to a gas station and say, look, if you use lower levels of light, it will cause less glare and will cause less melanopsin disruption. Please turn your lights down and do this. They're going to laugh at you. And they're going to say, but the person across the street has got 10 times as much light. So that's why you need either education where everybody agrees that this is a good standard or a good way to do business. Otherwise, you know, it's a jungle. And unfortunately, the jungle prevails right now. And any satellite map of the world will tell you that this is true. The way one entity differentiates itself on a retail is to put more light in. And so you just have to take a walk through New York at, at night. And there's all these retail interests competing for people. 
It's almost like the, you know, the loudest music is going to be heard first, or well, the brightest light is going to be seen for, first. Is that a good thing? People are thinking, we need to provide a lot of light at night so people can see, not really understanding that they may be producing conditions of glare and discomfort, which cause even more serious problems. Consider a scenario where a convenience store is, a crime takes place. Their response was, we need more light because then it'll be more safe. So they put a thousand watt metal halide lamp up there blasting on to the, to the area. Um, tell me, if they put up two, are they twice as safe? No. Okay, then let's say there's a crime that actually takes place. Have you ever been on stage? Do you know what it's like to be on stage and you have bright light shining in your face? What can you see? Nothing. So let's say you're the responding officer. You're the cops coming into this parking lot. What are you faced with? A thousand watts of metal halide glory blinding you and you can't see what's in front of you. Is that safe? No, that's not. Better lighting is safe, not more lighting. So in this particular case, if they had lights that were shining down and not in the face, that way you're switching the tactical advantage back to the responding officers instead of the perpetrator. You have installed criminal-friendly lighting by putting in poorly designed knee-jerk reaction, oh, brighter means safer. That's not the case. Think about what you're doing. And in most cases, subtle, subdued lighting is a much safer situation. Even better if it could be on a motion sensor, because that way the perpetrator would trip the light and everybody notices. If you look at most robberies or most crimes are actually done during the day or done in well-lit areas. A very famous astronomer um, was mad because they had lit the campus where he was and they shined lights on the observatory where he worked. And he complained about that. And various groups said, you're, you're for the criminals, you're terrible. Uh, we can't do anything about this. This is protecting us from crime. And so he went to the scene of every violent crime in, in this modest-sized city in Connecticut for two years and documented the lighting. And every one, most of the crimes, uh, robberies and assaults and murders, were almost all during the day. And the ones at night were all in the areas. Took these statistics and finally got the lights taken down and not shining. He got better lights put in this campus. The city of Chicago decided to light all of their alleys really bright. And that's where the crimes took place because criminals need a lot of light to see as well. So just throwing light at the problem is not the solution. We waste most of the light that we install in cities by having it shine straight up into the air. We human beings, we are not afraid of giant mutant creatures sweeping out of the dark sky to abduct us. So there's no reason we should be lighting up the sky. There's nothing up there that's bad for us to see. Rather, there is an entire sky full of stars that we would love to see. So put the light on the ground where we need it and we can get stars and be safe. Everything's being replaced by LEDs now. They're, they use substantially less amount of watts to achieve the same level of illuminance. The solid state technology offers opportunity for unprecedented levels of con control. And control is both uh, the intensity, the amount, the amount of light, the amount of light over time. So you may want to have more light in the early evening and less light late in the evening. The other interesting point is, is that you can make any color you want. Critical thing is that the LEDs uh, be a 3,000 Kelvin temperature or less. Those in the 3,000 Kelvin have less short wavelength emission, call it less blue light. no perfect LED, there's always going to be some sort of uh, additional blue light, short wavelength emission, compared to the older high pressure sodium. Our human eye perceives the blue light much better and it appears bright. So like say in, in Tucson, we have switched over to 3000 Kelvin LEDs, but at the same time we dropped the illuminance level 60%. and. In so doing, nobody has noticed. It still looks about the same brightness as the previous technology did. And in addition, we dim the lights even further at 11 o'clock. So it's just down to 30% of what the output was 
with the older technology. When you do those things, you reduce the lumen output and you change the technology. There's actually less blue light going into our night sky now than there was with the previous high pressure sodium technology. The city of Phoenix, they had originally specified 4,000 Kelvin products and the word got out that, wait a minute, these, we've, we've heard this is not good. And they went to the city council and said, let us see what you're actually doing. So they actually put up um, in various places around town the different lights that they were thinking about. And had the people said, come take a look, what do you think? And unanimously was, we want the warmer product. In this case, it was 2700 Kelvin. We actually installed different color temperature lights running at different amperages on one single street and invited the community to come out and take a look. The highest color temperature running at the highest wattage and amperage was the least preferred. The lamps that were running at the lowest color temperature and lower, lowest amperage were the most preferred. LEDs have both promise and peril. Okay, they're not all good. You can have some LED lamps that are, are very cold I mean, the, the Kelvin temperatures up in the four, five, even 6,000 degree range. They become piercingly blue, very harsh. If you don't understand what I'm saying, have you ever driven at night and you see some cars have those headlights? Everybody knows what I mean when I say those headlights. They're despised by oncoming traffic. You're looking at five, 6,000 Kelvin products because they needed that kind of temperature to get a reasonable efficacy. In the decades time, the technology has improved so fast that it's now possible to get 2,700, 3,000 Kelvin products that will have double the efficacy of what a 5,500 Kelvin product had 10 years ago. We're seeing a relatively rapid market transformation from HPS to LED. It's happening so quickly that I would characterize this as a rush. And in many cases, I would characterize it as an uninformed rush. And we are doing many things with lighting that we should not be doing. And this is being the press for energy savings, the press to, to transform our mar market space into LED. So what we ended up today is that we have many municipalities that have put in lights that are very glary, have the wrong color temperature, are, um, are very disturbing. There are street lights that are so uncomfortable that you have to put your hand over your eyes. And it's atrocious that we have this in our environments, absolutely atrocious. So in this push, we moved very quickly from HPS, which was uh, predominantly a yellow spectrum with very little blue into it, to a whitish blue spectrum that had an enormous amount of blue in it. And they were cheap, pushed out very quickly. We saw a lot of cities rush, rush, rush to this, and they got the energy savings. But unfortunately, the blue end of the spectrum for these light sources also matches up pretty closely to the melanopsin sensitivity of your eye. And the melanopsin sensitivity controls the melatonin, and melatonin is a foundation hormone that, that impacts many other body processes, hormonal processes. Blue light at night is what's problematical for nocturnal habitat disruption, circadian disruption and sky glow. There's enough scientific evidence out there now that is saying that, you know, light at night is probably not good for us. And it's more specifically the blue end of the spectrum. A, a gentleman in Anchorage, Alaska described to me during his test installations, so it was like living under an arc welder. It was hated. It was just this piercing, high, blue, ouch, light. He's completely curious to see them complaining of the blue light when the blue light is more natural for us because the blue light is the light of the day. So they see better, they have the feeling that they are more safe, more secure, but still they are not happy with this light. Our question of research was to find a way to measure the impact of street light on the quality of our sleep. The light in our street have a direct correlation with the amount of sleep that we were taking during the night. The light that we put on our head inside of the cities as a consequence during the day. You have an excessive sleepiness. People living near a big road 
with a big amount of light. These people were practically all sleeping after midnight. Also, if it was possible to close completely their windows with big curtains, still the effect was the same. So it was beginning probably in the evening. Blue is a problem, is our light of the day. And this is increasing our alertness. The secretion of melatonin will be delayed. Our biology on an evolutionary basis has never seen blue light at night, ever. There's lots of studies out there showing that it's harmful for birds and, and animals. It upsets nocturnal behavior. Insects are drawn towards lights and birds and bats follow them into the cities where they exhaust themselves flying around or into towers. Artificial light at night has not just an effect on certain species, but also on ecosystem functions. Artificial light at night keeps the pollinators away from visiting flowers and thereby reduces the pollination success of plants. We found out that artificial light at night reduces the number of visits to flower by about 60%. Dung beetles. Dung beetles use the Milky Way as a navigation point in the sky in order to roll their little balls of dung in a straight line away from other dung beetles that might want to steal it. The dung beetles use the night sky to navigate, sort of like a buffet of compass cues to guide them along their routes. A little insect, of course, has a very small brain, less than the size of a grain of rice. It's actually amazing that such a tiny brain can allow an insect to do such an amazing thing as navigate in a straight line. So. This idea that, that we humans alone use the sky above and that only we are going to be effective if it goes away is just wrong. Artificial light at night is a major problem for birds, and it's especially a problem during migration. So migration happens in the northern hemisphere twice a year in the fall and in the spring. There are hundreds of millions of birds flying over New York City at night, and they're using the stars to navigate, they're using the, the moon to help them see things, they're using the the Earth's magnetic field, they're hopping on the right winds, tailwinds to carry them in the right direction. And then they're flying along and let's say they fly past New York City and all of a sudden there's this big light and birds are attracted to light. Birds do go fly to the light and then we've seen in these very strong beams of light like a cilometer used at an airport or a tribute in light memorial that we have here every year in New York City. Birds will fly to that light beam and then they'll wind up flying around and around and around. They can't get out of it. We say they get caught in the light. Sometimes they get out on their own. <laughs> uh, sometimes we need to extinguish the light if we can. And 
The problem with the light, the light itself doesn't kill the birds. What the light does is it changes the bird's behavior. If you're changing behavior during migration, it's something the bird hadn't planned on. So it needed a little extra energy to carry it past that point. These are birds that are flying thousands and thousands of miles, sometimes without stopping, to get from one point to another. And they only have a certain amount of time to do it because their, their life, their offspring depend on it. And they don't have that extra energy that they carry to make a detour. And the energy that birds use is, for the most part, in the form of fat. But if you think about a person who's going on an airplane trip, you want to pack the most amount of stuff that you need in the smallest <laughs> suitcase, so you don't have to carry as much. Well, it's the same thing with the birds. They want to pack on as much fat as they can without being so heavy that it costs them more to fly. So having a detour like this can have a dramatic effect on the bird's survival. What we see is birds landing in places where they didn't plan to land because they get confused and tired, exhausted. And then the next day, when the light comes up, the natural light, the birds will continue on their flight or go to sit in a tree and look for food. And what they'll do, especially in a city, is fly into glass. So either transparent or highly reflective glass. The bird thinks it's flying into a tree, but it's flying into the reflection of a tree. Or the sky, it's really flying into the reflection of the sky, and it's flying at a good clip. We find dead birds on the streets during migration. And these birds are in great condition, except that they have concussions or they have broken, broken skulls, internal injuries from hitting a wall. About one billion birds die every year in the United States just from collision. Florida is host to around 90% of all the sea turtle nesting that occurs in the United States. Not only does light confuse uh, adult sea turtles and typically cause them to nest in lower numbers on beaches that are highly lit, it also confuses hatchling sea turtles when they come out and emerge from a nest. The impacts of lighting show up in two different ways. One is that the adult females who are attempting to come to shore to nest are generally dissuaded from nesting where there is a lot of artificial light. You know, if you imagine this animal evolved over millions of years to return to a beach uh, at night to lay its eggs and a beach at night is supposed to be dark. In the modern era, turtles are returning to shore. You can imagine they're 100 meters offshore, looking at the place where they want to come up, and it's just lit up. There's all these artificial points of light. It is disorienting to them. They perceive it as a threat, and so they don't nest as much in areas where there's a lot of light. Sort of the converse is true for hatchling turtles. Here are newly emerging turtles that have never been outside of the nest, literally. They're going into the open air for the first time, and in order to survive, they must get to the water and then swim offshore and find the currents and the habitat that they can survive in. And that initial instinct on how to get to the water is influenced by several things very strongly, one of which is the slope of the beach. They tend to understand that the downward seems to be the direction to go in, but even more powerful is the light. On a dark sky, even with no moon or no stars, a cloudy dark sky at night, the direction of the water is still the brightest horizon. Hatchlings have developed this instinct to go in the direction of the brighter horizon. Obviously, if towards the land is the brighter horizon because of artificial light, it attracts them, and that's what we see. In Florida alone, every year, tens of thousands maybe even 100,000 or more hatchlings are disoriented and go toward the land rather than toward the sea, and that's that. Here's an animal that's been around for uh, more than 100 million years and has survived through ice ages, through all kinds of environmental calamities and obstacles in the environment. And we come along and because we want our back patio lit up, and light shine out onto the beach, we're actually causing the deaths of this ancient animal that predates the dinosaurs.
Light pollution is the one form of pollution that's relatively easy to solve. The amazing thing about light pollution, unlike all the other work that I'd done previously with endangered species and migratory birds and wetlands restoration, it takes years and years, if not millennia, to restore those systems to back to some semblance of what they were before. Whereas with light pollution, you literally can flip a switch and make a difference immediately. U.S. national parks have become one of the best places to go to see a, a natural night sky. When the national parks did surveys asking visitors what did they find most special about visiting a national park, uh, a star-filled sky is right up there with uh, wildflowers, waterfalls, and wildlife. National parks are such a great place to come and view the night skies because there's so few places left that don't have the intrusion of light pollution. If you have naturally dark places, you also have naturally wild places. So the soundscapes and the night skies are a way for us to conserve and preserve the wildness of a place. And that's important because there's so few wild places left. Night sky talks in national parks are the number one ranger program given across the country. My favorite part about doing night sky programs is seeing visitor reactions. When they realize that the Milky Way is a huge streak of stars in the sky and not a cloud, the reactions are off the wall. They just go nuts. We've got the handle here and the top of the teapot, and the Milky Way is the steam out of the teapot. <laughs> The Dark Sky Festival started in 2012. We've been doing astronomy programs in the park for a number of years before then. The festival started with just a handful of volunteers and a few telescopes, and now it's growing into a huge event where we've got multiple volunteers hosting thousands of visitors and over 40 different events throughout the weekend. We also have Junior Ranger astronomy programs where kids can come out, learn about the solar system, learn about some of the shooting stars and meteorites that they're gonna see later that night. Now, I need somebody who's got a really good sense of rhythm. It can give me a beat. You guys see that? Okay. So I'm going to call it out. You guys are going to call it back to me, all right? The Astronomer Boogaloo. We're astronomers, and we're here to say... We're astronomers, and we're here to say... We study the stars every day. We study the stars every day. Sometimes we use a dark up here. You might have noticed that when you're camping if you have to get up in the night. Oh, it's dark, huh? We don't have street lights. We don't have mall. We don't have shopping centers and all that. We just have a lot of nature, don't we? And nature doesn't have a lot of lights. There's no lights in the trees, are there? You want to say that with us, boys and girls? Are you ready? My very educated mother just served us nectarines. Nice. Okay. Let's say that again. Ready? My very educated mother just served us nectarines. Woo! No, don't show them. <laughs> and I chant. Ready? My very Astronomy and dinosaurs, I mean, those are the two things that every kid seems to, to be fascinated by and wonder about and excited, it just, it fires the imagination. Watching a kid see Saturn through a telescope is one of the coolest experiences. It excites me so much, it is a gateway to all other sciences. But they really, they, they serve as a gateway to the sciences, a gateway to wonder about our universe. One of the great things about astronomy is that it's not a science, it's all science. Astronomy is physics, astronomy is chemistry, mineralogy, geology, meteorology, even now it's biology. 
I'm really excited. You know, we've only been doing the Dark Sky Festival for a few years, but wouldn't it be great if uh, 20 years from now, somebody who came to the Dark Sky Festival was inspired to become a scientist or engineer at NASA uh, because they had a chance to speak with, uh, with a NASA scientist while they were here and then look through a telescope. We're seeing a rapid increase in expansion. So we have fewer and fewer wild places left. So I hope we can build that next generation of stewards to realize the value in protecting naturally wild places. The mission of the International Dark Sky Association is to create a world without light pollution. We spend a lot of time trying to educate uh, individuals, communities, as well as policymakers about the issue of light pollution and how they can be solved. IDA has 60 or 70 chapters around the world, and these are made up of people, individual citizens, who care very, very much about protecting the night sky. We've got a really great program called the International Dark Sky Places Program, and it's a certification program, and it's very rigorous, it's, it's evidence-based, it's scientifically grounded, that uh, identifies the last remaining really amazing dark sky landscapes uh, around the globe. The goal of the program is to recognize the efforts that people are undertaking in places all around the world to try to preserve what remains of natural darkness where it still exists. We have about 85 designated international dark sky places in the world. Policy can be very effective in trying to both preserve conditions as they are, but also to even roll them back. And there's an interaction between policy and the international dark sky places where we have some evidence that the efforts that are undertaken to protect the dark sky places have actually resulted in the sky getting darker. Tucson area is, is known for its world-class observatories. And as the ambient light pollution increased with the growth of Tucson, the astronomy community said, we've got a problem here that we need to fix. Our two co-founders, Tim Hunter and Dave Crawford, they developed one of the most progressive lighting ordinances that, that controls lighting uh, in Tucson. So it's a very dark, it's a very quiet city from a light pollution perspective. If you look at Kitt Peak, there have been studies over the years, the quality of the skies has not deteriorated in the last 20 years. It remains one of the darkest cities around the nation and I think is a prime example of how light pollution can be managed without sacrificing safety. There are many beaches around Florida where there's high density sea turtle nesting, like the Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge, Hobe Sound. It's extremely dark on the beach at night. I mean, there are homes and condominiums along that beach, but they're all using turtle-friendly lights or else they just have turned their lights off completely on the ocean side at night. So it's quite dark on the beach. There's no evidence of increased crime because of sea turtle-friendly lighting. In fact, one of the things that people don't really understand until they experience it is that you can actually see better at night in sea turtle friendly lighting. All of our exterior lighting is dynamically controlled on a local basis where the lights will, will dim down considerably during periods of inactivity and when there's, when there's people or cars or, or bicycles that will ramp up. Our chief of police here, if they're doing tours around campus or around the city, if they see the lights turning on, they'll do a turn in. Or if they see the facade of a building at full light, they know that somebody's there or has been there and they'll take a look. And so now they actually talk about how this is contributing to, a, to the feeling of safety and security and they're calling it their safer campus. We can get about a 70% energy savings just by putting in adaptive controls. We've heard from a number of property owners when we've converted most of their exterior lighting to sea turtle friendly light, they've seen a 75% reduction in their utility bill. Most of the big cities right now are making the switch and are going with the warmer products. Chicago has specified 3000 Kelvin. Tucson did. San Francisco has just made that declaration. We are upgrading 18,500 of our high pressure sodium street lights. We also took notice when the AMA issued their guidelines saying that cities and counties looking to upgrade their street lights should choose LED lights that are 3000 Kelvin temperature or below. And we're making sure that all that light is directed down. There's no light that's going up. We're lighting our streets, not lighting our skies.
There are a lot of advantages to using LED lights and replacing our high-pressure sodium street lights. LED lights in general produce a more uniform light distribution. The LED lights last longer, up to 20 years. The high-pressure sodiums last three to five years. So you're gonna save on maintenance costs. The LED lights use up to 50% less energy per light. At our cost of service, we're projecting that we will save close to a million dollars per year on electricity costs alone. In some ways, it's easier to save the stars than other form of pollution. If you think about it, lots of forms of pollution, like cleaning up a river or taking the carbon dioxide out of the air, is really tough. But light pollution is real simple to solve. Don't put lights in where you don't need it. Put the right amount in the ground, shield it so it goes to the ground, and turn it off when it's not needed. Light where you need it, when you need it, and the amount necessary and no more. Why pay for something you're getting no benefit out of? A good design would not shine light up. No light should shine above the product itself. Try to implement some type of control system. We have a program here at the International Dark Sky Association called the Fixture Seal of Approval that provides individuals who are looking for ways to make a difference at their home or in their community. A wide variety of products which can be found on our website. There are three different features that we can adjust to make the light less disoriented. One is to bring it closer to the ground. If we lower that light physically, then less of it reaches the beach itself. The other is to keep it shielded so that it's really focused on only those areas where we need it. There's no reason to light up the whole sky or have light shine out onto the beach. Sort of more on a technological basis, longer wavelengths of light tend to disorient turtles less. Every one of the places where we have retrofitted lights and there was disorientation before, there has been no disorientation after. We have grant money to pay for the fixtures and the bulbs for lighting retrofits. You'd be surprised that sometimes we also get declined. The number one response when you start talking to property owners is, oh well, how am I gonna be able to see? They have a safety concern. They have a fear of losing light. Is it going to make my property more vulnerable to crime? Those are natural responses, especially natural when people have never encountered sea turtle friendly lighting. In many cases they hear, oh, you know, turtle friendly lighting means it's going to be dark. And that's not the case. It's just you have to experience what the light is going to be like. It's of the same spectrum that was the lighting for the Golden Gate Bridge for decades. For New York City Audubon's Lights Out program, we ask buildings to turn their lights out after midnight. It hasn't been a tremendous success because we only have about 100 buildings in the entire city of New York that sign on to turn their lights out for birds. It's interesting, you'd think that people would want to turn their lights out. It's like a no-brainer, right? Turn the lights out, save money. Why are the lights on anyhow? There's no one in the building. But there is pushback. and. You get pushed back by all kinds of reasons or explanations, like, well, we don't know who turns the lights out, or our cleaning people need the lights on, or it's a safety issue to keep lights on at night. All those issues I can acknowledge, and they can all be worked around. Cleaning people need the lights on when they're cleaning, and they can turn the lights out when they leave the room. Or for safety, is to have a motion sensor light so when people are moving around then the light lights up um, and that's going to make a signal to people that there's someone moving around where they're really not supposed to be. It's part of the city to me to not have the night sky. It's always surprising to me if I can see something at all. So to me it's not like I'm disappointed that the city doesn't have the night sky. What I am concerned about is that the cities will overwhelm the parts of the world that can see the night sky. Light knows no boundaries. It travels forever. Spreading the word to those bigger cities, while they might be really far away, the impact that they have on the natural darkness here at Lassen is, is pretty significant. So we hope that folks visiting from uh, San Francisco and Reno and Sacramento will go back and realize that the little things that they can do to reduce the light impact in those big towns actually will make a difference here at Lassen. People who are unfamiliar with our organization and they hear dark sky and they're going to we want to turn off all the lights. No, that's not the case. Our name says dark sky. It doesn't say dark ground. 
You can have both. There's no reason why you can't have excellent lighting and still see the stars. I live in Tucson, a municipality of over a million people, and I live seven miles from the city center, and I can see the Milky Way from my driveway every night. There's no reason why that can't be the case everywhere. Looking for asteroids, that's planetary defense. That's trying to protect the human race from potential impacts. And we know that those impacts have happened in the past. We know that the dinosaurs were wiped out by the asteroids. So, you know, there's some practical importance to it uh, as well. But the other thing is, it's just the basic desire to know. You look out there among the stars, you see what's out there, you want to understand it. You want to know how did it get there? You know, are we alone? By eliminating light pollution, by reducing that, we give the birds a better chance to see the stars. And the stars is what they're using to navigate with. We humans are smart enough to figure out how we're impacting the rest of the planet and other forms of wildlife and take relatively modest actions to give these animals a chance to survive. So if you do these simple things of shielding, lower wattage, lower uh, power LEDs, and an oranger, yellower LEDs, we can get the stars, we can be safe, we can save electricity, we can save natural resources. We can do all of this, and we get that sky full of stars. It's a win-win, win-win situation. We can all benefit from this and live in an industrial technological world perfectly safe and see the Milky Way once again the way everyone used to. The majority of LED products that are being used in, this, in the changeout are dark sky friendly design. So it, it, this change in technology will actually accelerate the improvement. Shielding a light has an immediate effect. You don't have to wait for the environment to respond to it because it will begin responding immediately. And the number of times that I've had interactions with people in my line of work where I explain this to them, where I give them a demonstration and I show them how uh, easy the solution is, the response that I get more often than not is people say, I had no idea. I didn't realize. It's awareness. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, again, to change this human notion about what light at night is and what it can do. And we start by building awareness that there's a problem under the belief that when enough people realize that it's a problem, they will then demand a solution. And I foresee that that, that time is coming and it's probably going to happen sooner than we think. What do you like about looking at the night skies or being under, uh, seeing so many stars? Uh, it makes me feel peaceful because it, we have like a really big world and the universe is so vast. And when you look at the night sky, you can kind of get lost in it. It feels really magical because everyone's doing it together. For different galaxies, yeah. in different and galaxies, that, for different solar systems, yeah. Some yeah. of them don't even exist anymore. It's just the light trying to get to us. <laughs> You're absolutely right. What's your favorite planet? Mars. My favorite planet is Neptune. Neptune? My, fa my favorite is Mars. Why? Because my favorite color is red, and I kind of like the explosive dust that's on Mars. Like in New York, they probably wouldn't be able to see the stars because Everyone always has lights on. There's big posters with lights around them, and there's street lights. So 